Welcome back to the channel. My name is David Noble. Now, one of the emerging talents from last year was Ollie Behrman. In fact, I may have gone so far as to say this about him in a video I did with Alex from the S19 channel in Samagara, which apparently including them on videos is the only way I can get anyone to watch them these days. There you go. I think there's one, there's one more name, I think. There, there, there might be one more name, yes. So I, I, wonder, I wonder who that could be. I said about this guy at the start of the year when I was talking about what became GB3 was still British F3 at the time, that he could very much have a season not too dissimilar to Lando Norris had in 2016. And wouldn't you know it, he did. <laughs> you know, it's like... Now, after I said that, I realised that some people might not actually know what I mean by that. I mean, everyone is aware of Lando Norris, McLaren star. But 2016 was the year I first started following his career with interest, and it didn't disappoint. So, I thought I'd take a look at the two years side by side to see if my statement was justified. Now, coming into 2016, Lando was actually something of a known quantity on the British junior scene already. You know, as well as winning the CIK FIA World Karting Championship in 2014, he'd taken his first steps in car racing, competing in the Genetta Junior Championship, finishing third overall, and taking the rookie title. In 2015, he competed full-time in the British MSA Championship, which would become the British F4 Championship the following year. You know, he took the title from some stiff competition as well, including full-time entries from guys like Colton Herter, Inam Ahmed, Ricky Collard, Sandy Mitchell, Matthias Leist, and initially at least, Dan Tictum. Uh, he also moonlighted in the ADAC F4 and Italian F4 series, competing in 17 races across both series, racking up one win, six podiums, and several fastest laps. You know, so Lando had shown he had form and was one to look out for. Now, Ollie was coming into 2021 having competed in ADEC F4 in a part season of Italian F4 in 2020. You know, it stepped up a year earlier than originally planned, having taken European and world titles in karting, but stepping straight into those particular F4 series is normally a challenge. You know, quite often drivers will do a year in British, French or Spanish F4 before crossing to them, so it was definitely a learning year. But, you know, he learned quickly, finishing 7th overall in his full ADAC season and 2nd in the Rookie Championship, taking one overall win, three wins in the Rookie class. You know, while he wasn't doing the full season in Italian F4, the results he got in the eight races he competed in were still enough to take 10th in the Championship in a series that frequently had 30-plus drivers racing in it during the year. You know, another overall win in those eight races would set him up well for 2021. Now, starting 2016. Now, the point I first became aware of Lando Norris was while watching him racing in the Toyota Racing Winter Series. You know, at the time, it was the premier off-season and series for young drivers wanting some track time before their European adventures began. You know, drivers that year included the likes of the Ferrari-backed Guan Yu Zhao, the Force India-backed Johanda Ravala, Ferdinand Habsburg, and Pedro Piquet. You know, Lando took the title, securing. 11 podiums in 15 races, including 6 wins, so a good start to the year, setting him up well for the main event. Now, the main event in this case was Formula Renault, you know, two different series in fact, both Euro Cup and Northern European Championship, or NEC as it was called. You know, signing on for champions Joseph Kaufman Racing, there were some familiar faces in the paddock, you know, also racing for Joseph Kaufman with Johan Ravala and Robert Schwartzman, and the paddock also contained Ferdinand Hampsburg and Sasha Fenestrad. His main competition for the year, though, came from Max Tifoni, who would be having basically the best season of his career, and Dorian Bacalacci, who was coming off the bit of a bit of a struggle year in F3, but had a decent year in French F4 the season before. You know, like so many drivers' careers, his career would hit trouble because of financial issues. EuroCup saw Lando take the title with five wins and seven other podiums in 15 races, uh, with NEC starting off respectively. But from the second Silverstone race, it really took off, with Orlando then taking 10 poles in a row, netting 6 wins and 3 seconds, and claiming his third championship in the same year. Like a side quest, Lando spent his time, spare time racing for Carlin in British F3 against several of his former F MSA foes. As he wasn't doing the full season, he couldn't make it four titles, because that would have basically been mathematically impossible, but the 11 races still yielded four wins with three fastest laps and three poles from a possible eight. 
You know, to round off his near perfect season, he was also awarded the McLaren Autosport BRDC Young Driver Award and the Autosport for Best British Club Driver of the Year. And I was saying Ollie had a season like that. So, how right was I? No winter series for Ollie, it was full focus on ADAC and Italian F4 titles, doing four campaigns in both this time. Now, obviously while talking about Lando's year, I was talking about a lot of drivers who have gone on to establish themselves at a high level, and are known to a lot of race fans. You know, I doubt anyone listening to this hasn't heard me talking about them before. Now, with the competition in F4 though, they're currently young drivers at the start of their careers, so it might be worth chatting about a few of them. Now this information has been taken from like Wikipedia, driver profile sites, and in some cases their websites. So there might be some errors, at least from my pronunciation, if nothing else. Now the main competition, Tim Tramnitz, who had beaten Ollie to the rookie title in 2020. Now, currently his racing career seems to sit at 56 single-seater races, 10 wins, which is more than respectable. You also had Luke Brown with racing, who was coming to the season as the reigning British F4 champion. Now, on his website, he has a massive two sponsors and is racing in GB3 this season, so there might be a slight question mark about budget holding him back, but the basic talent certainly seems to be there. Now, Victor Bernier has a racing record of four wins from 65 starts, but finished first in the 2018 CIK FIA Junior Karting World Championship. Nikita Bedrin, the only real F4 rookie on the list in 2021, was first in the CIK FIA World Championship in 2019, and now at least has four wins in 57 races. As for Joshua Defec, the Swiss racer with the Austrian-German father, English mother, who was born in Camden Town in London. It's a very Swiss. CIK FIA World Karting Championship winner 2019. Then we get on to Sebastian Montoya, the son of Juan Pablo. He's had a respectable, if not stunning, record in F4, with 14 podiums, 8 fastest laps and 5 poles, so the speed is certainly there. But in 2022, he's done a park campaign in Formula Regional Asia against some pretty quality opposition, and he's taken two wins, which is impressive. Uh, lastly, out of the main contenders, we've got Kirill Small, which I misspelt as Krill initially and spent 10 minutes wondering why all the information I had was about these things. Sorry, Kirill. My bad. Yeah, so, this is me looking a bit idiotic. Anyway, the latest SMP backed Russian who isn't Robert Schwartzman had a similar racing record, up until the start of this year anyway, to his Prima teammate Montoya, with 57 starts, 2 wins, 3 poles, 3 fastest laps, 11 podiums, and a fair amount of potential. So, look out for these races, you will be seeing them again. Ollie's ADAC season took off with him taking five wins in the first seven, but following that it would be another ten races before he took another win, but with six additional podiums during that period, it meant he managed to keep the championship lead from rival Tramnitz, securing it in the final round by 26 points. The Italian F4 looked initially to be going differently, with Tim Tramnitz getting off to two wins in the first round. But rounds 2, 3, 4 and 5 saw Ollie on almost unstoppable form though, as he took eight wins in nine races. His only loss being as a result of a controversial DSQ. A commanding lead, he was solid for the next few rounds, before taking triple wins in the final round. If the ADAC title had been respectably close in the end, Italian F4 was an annihilation with a gap to second of 111 points. Now, these results made Oli Behrman the only driver in history to win both titles in the same year. In between his F4 commitments, he was also racing a park campaign in British F3, which became GB3 partway through the season. Now, after the first round, he was second in the championship. At Snetterton he was showing great pace winning the first race but a retirement from the lead in the second kind of stopped his winning run and a DNF at Silverstone as well meant that on paper a season didn't look as impressive as it actually had been. You know, In reality every race he could qualify for he started near the front and in the races he took three second places and a win. You know, he was quick in the reverse grid races as well gaining nine places at Brands Hatch and ten places at Silverstone. In November, it was confirmed he'd be joining the Ferrari Driver Academy, which I'm very happy about. He was also one of the four finalists of the Aston Martin Autosport BRDC Young Driver Award.
So, the all-important question, was I right in what I said? Well, let's take a quick look at the numbers. Lando competed in three full championships and won all three. He competed in a total of 60 races in a year. Of those, he won 21, which is a win percentage of 35%. He also took 28 poles and won the McLaren Autosport Award, which set him up well for joining the McLaren Young Driver Program soon after. You know, a large part of the reason I talk about Lando in 2016 is because I genuinely consider it to be the benchmark for junior formula success in a single year. And, I mean, you can see why. He was the only person ever to win both those Formula Renault titles in the same year, and as a rookie as well. By midway through that year, I was telling anyone who would listen about this future F1 star coming their way. So, how did Ollie do by comparison? Well, he completed in two full championships, becoming the only person to win both in the same year. You know, with running one less championship, he only, you know, it's terrible, raced in 48 races in a year, but took victory in 18 of them, giving him a winning percentage of 37.5%, and he had 15 poles, which doesn't sound as much as Lando's, but Lando had a quali session for every Formula Renault race, whereas Ollie only had quali session for two and three in F4, and Lando had nearly a quarter more races, so the numbers in reality are much closer than they appear on paper. And becoming part of an F1 academy? Tick. You know, he's part of the Ferrari Driver Academy at the end of the year, which, as I said, I'm rather happy about. I don't think I'm as wrong saying what I said. Yeah, I mean, there are differences. As much as I try to make them mirror each other as much as possible for, you know, because this would be a really weird video if I didn't. Um, but Formula Renault is technically a category up on F4, you know, even if it we're talking ADAC and Italian F4. And Lando was technically a rookie, although I don't doubt for a second he maximised every bit of testing or sim time he could get. You know, Lando did more races, which included three races in European F3 in Macau in preparation for 2017, which knocked his race win percentage down a small amount. No, I mean, it works the other way as well. In British F3 in 2016, the series was changing up, having been British F4 the previous year. You know, the cars had been significantly upgraded with increased aero and power. So everyone that year was going in pretty even, and Lando at Carling would be as well prepared, if not more, as any of them. You know, Ollie, by comparison, was racing against several drivers who'd had at least a year's experience and had been successful in that championship. You know, the obvious one being yet and Simmons, but both Bart Horston and Risa Shijima could build on a year as well. And, but for reliability issues and a bit of bad luck, he could have easily added to that win in multiple podiums that he had. Ultimately, to me, it comes down to this, you know. The road to being an F1 driver is a tricky one. There are people who have won every championship they've ever done a full season in and fell off the ladder for budget reasons. You know, sponsors can pull out the team that looked like it was going to take you to the title could have a bad year. Drivers themselves can have a bad year. In fact, even if everything goes right and you win everything you're supposed to, as we've seen with Oscar Piastri this season, if there's not a seat available, there's not much you can do. All you can really aim for is to do the best you can, and looking at that, Ollie is certainly doing everything right. This looks to include the next step on the ladder. You know, getting into Prima and F3 instantly gives you a chance, but it does put a target on your back. You know, it's an opportunity that I'm sure he'll make the most of. If I'm going to stick with my Lando comparison, Lando won Euro F3 the following year, so... What's the odds of me having to do a similar video next year? Obviously, I wish Ollie well on his quest for racing glory. Um, thank you for watching and take care. If you have any thoughts regarding this, leave your thoughts in the comments. And bye bye for now.